Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and I am so excited about today's guest. But before we get there, I have a couple of really quick announcements because today we're talking about keyword best practices, and I can't wait for you to meet today's guest. But first, you have to also know you're coming to the Facebook group, right? Right? Come to the Facebook group. That's where you get all your questions answered, everything else, but you know you need the cheesy code word, right? This week's code word is keywords. Why? Because we don't like spammers. We don't like people selling us a whole bunch of stuff that we don't want or need. We only want people interested in super awesome, hot fire Amazon questions and answers so you can move your business forward. Speaking of moving your business forward, um, I have a brief and special announcement. The Q4 Jumpstart class is back this year. It's going on July 22nd. It. It's live. Don't worry if you can't come live because you can certainly watch the replay at your convenience. But if you're just learning to sell, you haven't been through a Q4 yet, you want to know the biggest sales season of the year is Q4. You want to be ready. The Jumpstart class is awesome. If for the past four years, We've been hosting this class and it's been an amazing experience. The mega holiday season's coming, time to prepare. You're gonna learn what to sell, how to sell it, where to sell it, when to send it in so that you're not stuck with not knowing what to do when Q4 hits. You wanna be prepared right now. Did you know that I'm sending in Q4 orders right now to my wholesalers? Mommyincome.com slash jumpstart to get registered for the Q4 class. Again, if this is your first Q4, this is essential for you. You want to be prepared. You want to be ready. And this is jumpstart. Why are we thinking about this in the middle of summer? Because we can't wait until the fall to think about that. They'll be out of stock, especially with all the Corona stuff going on. You know how it's going to be. All right. This special guest that I have today, Stephen Pope, myamazonguy.com. There he is. Welcome Hello. to the show, Stephen. I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So I'm going to jump right into it. You were a TV reporter before you were my Amazon guy. Talk I about was. that for a minute. You bet. So I started my career out as a television reporter up in Idaho and had lots of fun being a reporter, hated working for the news industry, loved being a television reporter. And I got to do crazy fun things like fly and sun airplanes, interview and put politicians on the spot on the coals. And just every day was something different. So my favorite thing that I learned about being a reporter, though, is all about asking questions. And if you just ask the right question and communicate and make network and meet people, you're going to be able to move your business forward just simply with that skill alone. If that's the only thing that you have a skill for, you can totally make it in the world. Obviously, along the way, I've learned a lot more than just how to ask questions uh, and have broken to marketing uh, since then and have been selling on Amazon for 10 years. And the first thing I sold was actually on eBay. It was a Magic the Gathering trading card uh, when I was 12 years old. So I can definitely nerd out with, uh, for those that are interested in ever nerding out with trading cards and retail arbitrage and all that good stuff too. So That is so fun. I, I too got my... my um start in e-commerce on eBay. I remember it was, I, the first thing I sold on eBay was, um, I wasn't 12 years old, by the way, <laughs> be far younger than me. Um, I, the first thing I sold was my uh, daughter's foo-foo Easter dress. We had, you know, that you buy these really cute Easter dresses to take pictures in and they wear it once and then they outgrow it. And you're like, what are we going to do with this? Yeah. And so I started flipping like my kids stuff just because why not? It's, it's laying around here. And I remember that fun. So how do you go from TV reporter to e-commerce director and start doing the things that you were doing for the different brands? Talk about that for a second. You bet. So I currently own an agency called My Amazon Guy. We're an 18-person agency, and we are a full-stop, one-stop shop for all things Amazon. So how I got to there from TV reporter, uh, I, I went back to school after being a television reporter. And basically, you know, I had a coming-of-age moment where I was like, uh, I'm, I'm doing live weather hits in the middle of a blizzard and it's Wisconsin, 10 o'clock at night, biggest blizzard in a decade. Everybody's home in their pajamas. Camera flips on to me. I missed my cue. I couldn't even see the camera. The blizzard was so blatant. My hair froze over. I missed my cue. felt like an idiot, looked like an idiot. And I was like, ah, oh, what? Are, I got to do something different with my life. So that moment I know resonates with a lot of your listeners potentially, where they're like, oh, something's got to change in my life. I got to progress something, right? So what I would encourage your listeners to do is take that moment and find the next step, find your progress. For me, that next step was to go back and get an MBA. I started working corporate side marketing. 
that is not the track most people should go and do if we're having this conversation on this podcast. But that's what I did. And over the years, I was on the corporate side working as a marketing manager and then an e-commerce director. And, and I literally could speak to any e-commerce channel, anything that increases traffic and improves conversion rate. I've dealt with it. I've, I've, I, I helped increase atmix.com 10 million uniques with uh, SEO traffic. I know my keywords. Amazon is a totally different beast than any other channel. And so really? a lot of things we'll talk no about today <laughs> is custom to Amazon specifically. Awesome. Yeah, we definitely want to dive into these keyword best practices because we know, you know, you're this keyword expert and not just that you've got all this other, all these other things at the agency. But before we jump into keywords, I do want you to talk about your momster brand that you have, because I think these, this yes. is just the best. So I'm going to clarify this for people that are listening. Momster. The first time he said this, I was like, monster momster what are you saying mom stir as in stir your drink they're wine glasses they're amazing you guys have to check out the monster brand on amazon and go look at these really snarky fun cute um wine glasses that that steven and his team are producing well i, I appreciate the sentiment there and and i actually thought that this brand would really resonate with uh, mommy income listeners so i um i created an agency mostly just because it happened, right? So like I, I lost my job and I had to go make an agency, but my true passion was always to have my own product business. And so the agency took off and I, I had to put this side hustle on the side called Momster, M-O-M-S-T-I-R, but it's definitely one of my favorite things to spend time on. And so it, it is getting close to becoming um, a million dollar brand. Uh, it's a wine glass brand with uh, funny sayings on it, like you mentioned. And I use it as my test bed. So I've got like 300 videos on my YouTube channel and I'd say a solid 70 of them or more are me inside of this account giving advice on how to grow Amazon. So it's on youtube.com slash my Amazon guy. And uh, I, I love this brand because I wanted to have something that would resonate with women who have kids. I've got three kids under five. My wife is a full-time stay-at-home mom. And, and we, uh, and, and she doesn't have time to help me on the business. She's, she's like full time mom. Right. But I wanted to give her something. And so I was like, you know, coming up with brand names and I came up with this one and I really loved it. And I was like, I was thinking my, my, my wife loves to cook. She's likes politics, but she's a mom. What could be something where she could feel all these things in one thing and mom stir, she stirs things up in the kitchen. She gets stuff done. So that's kind of how that brand came about. Um, and I use it as a test bed to prove how best practices or, or mistakes. I go make mistakes all the time on it. And, and, and mistakes, of course, lead to new ideas and progress. So uh, absolutely love, uh, love talking about wine glasses with funny sayings. And I'm constantly trying to figure out what's the next funny saying to put on a wine glass. Right now it's, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm social distancing uh, kind of language. So. Yeah. <laughs> so not drinking alone, I'm social distancing. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's funny. I was like, oh, I, I could probably give you several phrases to put some on there. I'll be your first customer. We'll have to talk about that after the show. Um, so seriously, that's, that's a great idea. So you've got this stuff, you use it as your test account, but it's also almost a million dollar brand. So you've got this private label I, stuff going on. Now, my listeners are really, really excited about learning more about keywords because well, no matter how great your product is, no matter how awesome, no matter how, how great you think it is, if no one can find it on Amazon because you don't have the right keywords, what difference does it actually make? So we want to make sure that we're building our listings, our titles, our descriptions, everything else so that all of the wonderful search bots can pick it up and put it on page one. So let's talk first about your keywords. When you start choosing your keywords, whether it's for your momster brand or for a client or for something else, where do you begin? What is your very first thing that you do when you start looking at keywords? I look at my competition first. Uh, so my favorite tool to use is called Helium 10. Yeah, yeah Mommyincome.com slash Helium 10 to get Helium 10, just so you know. <laughs> and I have uh, used every tool on the market from Helium 10 to Jungle Scout. Um, Helium 10 is absolutely the most powerful in my opinion. Um, it's the easiest to use, great UI. Um, and what I... What I use on there is I start with the Cerebro and I look at my competitors and I just download their list. In the top right of Helium 10, it gives you a word cloud. That word cloud is your signal to know that that's the language that should be in your listing. 
Those are the most common words with the highest impressions that are showing up and you need to have them in your listing, in your title, your bullets, your description, your A plus content, your alt text of your photos, we'll talk about that, and your search terms on the back end, your intended use, your target audience. Man, I just listed 10 attributes, I realize. But every one of these attributes needs to be optimized. If any one of those is blank, that's your five minute tip today. Go fill them out. Now, to you know what, just a, just a quick question, a quick comment about that. We've just talked about this recently in one of the trainings I did with um, Bradley from Helium 10 in our, in our membership site. We have the called the Amazon Files Hub. He came in there, talked about that specifically for wholesale bundlers. Because remember with wholesale bundlers and what we do here is um, it's very much like private label. So you are starting something from scratch, but the, the, the intended use, the subject matter, filling the target audiences, a lot of people skip those because they think it's irrelevant. But guess what? Every keyword matters in every spot. So don't leave that blank. We could end this today. Everybody go and fill out your, your, your intended use and all your subject matter and everything else. Okay, so when you're done with that, then what? Um, so from, from just simply filling it out, then you got to start figuring out what's my scalability, what's my solution to scale this across all my products. So the more products you have, the harder this gets, right? And you have to spend time doing it. And, and if you're, you know, the, the shorter your catalog, the more sophisticated you can get with your strategies. But basically, step one, fill it out. Step two, here's some best practices. Your keywords need to be in the search term field. I'm going to talk search term field first. There needs to be no commas, zero commas. The second thing is you need to not repeat a single word. And the third thing is don't use any plurals. Don't worry about the words like of and fillers. So that simplifies the following conversation. Those are your hard and fast rules. Don't break them. The rest is a little bit more subjective. And so the question is, is how do you use whatever tool you're using to figure out what are the most important keywords Use that 250 characters of text and shock it full of the most relevant things. Now, here's the things I would re make, recommend you do. If you're setting it up for the first time, I would put in all of the high volume words, including what's in your title. We'll come back to that. And then I would put in misspellings. And then finally, I would put in Spanish. And if you got room and you're still looking for things, I would then put in competitor brand names. But that's really weak in comparison to the rest of the list. So that's the framework I would work off. Now, how you go about doing that, that's the technical expertise. So you can use a tool like Helium and go into Cerebro, look at the word cloud, export it over to Frankenstein, delete all the dupes and boom, you got a list there and you start deleting it down until you got the list you want to work with and then go import it, right? So that's one way you could do it. Uh, there's a variety of different ways you could do it. But at the end of the day, your goal is to index for as many keywords as possible. And what do I mean by indexing? That is show up in search results for thousands of keywords. So if we're gonna talk about a wine glass, I wanna show up for terms like wine glass, gifts for her, Father's Day, and everything in between. So that's a very broad spectrum of keywords to work with. If we were talking about an apple slicer, very different question. We're talking about widgets and gadgets and things you do in the kitchen. And so your search terms and your intent to use and your audience types will focus in on that target demographic and use the words that they're using. It needs to be relevant. Can I break you? Can I break yeah. you for a second? I'm going to ask you about intended use. So I know this is not a main thing that a lot of people focus on. When you when you talk about the intended use section, and, and I know it's in under the search terms when you're building your listing, um, do you use the pre-filled ones or do you put your own thing? And do you put one word per line or do you fill it out completely? Like what is your strategy for the, the intended use um, fields? I think the jury is out on what the best practice is for intended use. And so I generally will do the following. I'll make the search terms the hyper maximized field, chock full of technical expertise. I will use the intended use in some of the other fields for more of the colloquial um, sayings. So easy that somebody who is a product expert but not a marketing expert could pull off. So what that means is if we're talking um, intended use for a wine glass, hey, I wanna target wine lovers. I wanna target um, gifts for him, that sort of language would go in the intended use. 
Um, I do not maximize those fields. I generally am using, I, I use all five bullets and I'll use a phrase per field. That's how I do it for that specific one. Um, I think the jury is out on the best practice for this particular area, however. I appreciate you saying that because that my experience has been the same and I haven't gotten some good hard fast data on that. So I'm glad that we share that sentiment. Yeah, I've, I usually put some phrases in mind, just one phrase per line. I think you four or That's five. exactly what I just did. Yep. And, um, you know, just just. I am really tight on my listings. And so I know a lot of people like to just like put every single word and every single thing. And I, I'm, I'm very, very particular about a keywords when it comes to different fields. So, so you've got your major keywords in your search terms. You've got filling out the intended use. Now you, you mentioned something about competitor brands. Now I know that there is some, um, debate in the Amazon space about using competitor brands within your listing. Um, talk about Can't why use it on the listing. That's a no go. That'll get oh, you in trouble. You but the search term, search term, but the search term field, eh, a little gray area. Okay. I just was, I just wanted to clear the air about that because I know some people are going to make comments on this video, like you're not allowed to do that. And so we just want to make sure that we let people know that it is a gray area because sometimes Amazon will say, yes, yeah, sometimes your listing is completely blocked and it will not index for anything because you've got some random brand in there. I mean, if you're selling, you know, knockoff shoes and you put Nike in the search terms and you come up on Nike, also Amazon pushes you down the list when your listing comes up with a search and no one clicks on it. They're like, oh no, this keyword's not relevant. So they start pushing you down anyway. So if you're trying to sell off-brand shoes and you use Nike somewhere in your listing, even if it's in the back end and no one's clicking on your listing because of that, they scoot you down through the algorithm anyway. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about using competitor brand names, especially high-end ones that everybody recognizes household names. Use that with caution. I, would, I wouldn't do the big brand names. I would only do things that are, you know, more niche focus. And again, I think it's like on my list of things to use it's at the bottom it's yeah. like if you're looking for additional things you run out of ideas then turn to it um, but I would say the highly relevant high impressions misspellings in Spanish are way in advance of that Speaking of the Spanish, I just want to just, this is like social proof for you guys or case study proof. I actually added some Spanish um, words to some of my listings that I would feel like were really relevant to that and looked up the Spanish components to that and put them in my listing. 20% increase in 30 days on one listing because I use Spanish. My own personal experience there. It you works. Know, it may vary, but using those Spanish words are really, really important. Of course, the thing that I was selling was actually really relevant to uh, Hispanic communities most of the time, and using Spanish makes perfect sense. Um, and so, you know, don't just throw Spanish random words in your head, but think about the communities. Think about different people with different languages and what they call different things when it comes to that. It's really, really. Um, Relatedwords.org also use that to, to build up your keywords because, you know, using the word red is not always the same red as everyone else thinks. So, you know, using relatedwords.org to be able to generate some more additional keywords to describe your item rather than what's just on Amazon or Helium 10 as well. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a one-two bus. So, okay, so let's talk about, okay, title. Um, let's narrow in on the keywords and title and how you would build a title in such a way that optimizes your listing. You bet. So best practices on title, you're supposed to put the brand name in the front. That's, you know, that's core. Everybody's heard that. You need to have your size and your color or your flavor or anything on the very far right at the end. And then the name of the product right after the brand name. And then the rest of it is where the conversation starts, right? So keywords in the title definitely matter. We know that right now, most categories will allow for 200 characters in a title. However, a year ago in June of 2019, they sent out this mass blast about how everybody's going to go down to 50 characters. Now, it took less than 10 days for them to back off of this. However, again, however, 2.0. In the last 60 days, we've seen them revisit the 50 character limit on some categories. Men's supplements, for example, has been hit hard with the character count limit. I believe anything related to topicals, beauty, consumables, potentially grocery, and anything medicinal are going to be the categories that are going to be hit first with this new title length limit. I believe home goods, which most of your podcasts, if I had to guess, follows home goods. Is that right? There's a big mix. So lots of people follow different, you know, sell all kinds of different things. I, I like the home category. So yeah, that would definitely be something. I'm I love the home category. I think the home category is the easiest to be in out of all categories on Amazon. And, uh, but the list, the list I gave you, 
are generally the harder ones to be in. Anything that's topical, you put it on your body or yeah. you consume it, harder to deal with, lower margins, more competition, more I regulation. Yeah, I stay away. I mean, I, I used to do grocery topicals, things like that. I'm approved in every category, but the massive headaches that you have to deal with is expiration dates and liability. Your insurance will quadruple if you're selling, you know, and by the way, guys, if you don't have insurance, you better have insurance on your business. Do you know the California warehouse that burned down with all the inventory in it? You don't get your money back for that inventory. It's your responsibility to protect yourself, your business, your assets. If you don't have insurance for that and tell your insurance company, if you sell anything that's ingestible, topical, anything like that, because your liability just quadrupled with that. So I don't mess with any of those things because I don't want to pay the extra insurance. And I don't want the liability of somebody, you know, getting some sort of rash because they put on, you know, their, their lotion and then they're coming after me. Good advice. And by the way, uh, one of the things I'll plug here is the fastest way to, there's, there's a lot of ways you can grow your sales. Fastest ways to launch more products. Second fastest is to launch on more marketplaces. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because you mentioned insurance. Well, if you want to launch on Wayfair, which may not be on most people's radars, you have to have insurance. Love yeah. Wayfair. That's like, okay, <laughs> you're giving away hidden secrets here. This is like an upcoming episode talking about selling on Wayfair because I think a lot of people don't realize that people like you and I, Amazon sellers, third party people, brick and mortar stores can actually peddle their wares on Wayfair. I love Wayfair as a shopper. I mean, I literally have a coupon to use in like two days, but the reality <laughs> is that you can sell. So if you have home goods, I mean, you guys all know, right, that Wayfair is furniture, bedding, mattresses, you know, a lot of home goods stuff, right? But you can take your Amazon listing and translate it right over to Wayfair. And so many stores are doing this because they do a lot of advertising. Guess what? You don't have to spend money on if you're putting your stuff set Wayfair. They're doing all the TV advertising. They're sending coupons out. They're doing that kind of stuff. Get your hat in the ring. But we'll, we, we'll save that for a different episode. Maybe we'll come back and talk about selling on Wayfair instead of just Amazon. But okay. So getting your stuff, you said, increase your products and then increase your marketplaces. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, products. and you know, just to finish that thought, Etsy, eBay, Walmart, those are the biggest ones right now. I would avoid Sears, Jet, but Bonanza, uh, Rakuten, Price Falls. Those are all weak. Uh, don't pay attention to those. Awesome. Okay. So we've got title character issues. We've got that, you know, filling it all out, brand name first. Now, if you have a private label brand name that nobody knows or recognizes, would you still put that brand name in the beginning of, of You're that? supposed to, but I don't. Um, I'll put it at the end and I'll say buy Monster, buy whatever. Um, certain categories, it's, it's way more uh, enforced than it is others. Home goods, you can get away with it right now. Yeah, because most people like it. This is, you know, what I'm teaching people with wholesale bundles is that people are creating their own brand of stuff and they're putting things together, whether it's their own private label brand or they're bringing things in from different vendors and creating gift sets and, and kits and things like that. Um, that brand name doesn't matter. It's the attributes that sell the item, right? If you're selling, you know, some, you know, sign that's back here, like, you know, in one of my decorations there, you know, people are looking for potted succulents. They don't care what brand it is. They're just like, I want cute potted succulents, or I'm looking for a snarky wine glass, you know? And so when they're looking at these things, they're not necessarily looking at brands to where if you're buying shoes, you're like Nike Air Jordans, whatever you're looking for. And it's usually a brand thing. So making sure that like you utilize the keywords and if your brand is not something anyone's ever going to search for, it doesn't matter tack it at the end and keep that there. But remember, there are some rules and policies in certain categories. So know your rules, know your policies. So okay. a couple, couple more thoughts on brands before we move past that. So right. my brand name, Momster, if you go type it in right now on amazon.com, it autocorrects to Monster Energy Drinks. <laughs> I've ticketed this every day, every week, and it's still a problem. So when you're going to choose a brand name, and eventually you will, if you wanna get past 5,000 in monthly sales, you're gonna to have to have your own brand name. You're gonna to have to go trademark a brand name. We do sell trademarks, by the way, at my Amazon guy. By the um, way, just just now typed in Momster on Amazon, all your stuff comes up. So you great, can somehow great. fix so it. That's I did good to hear. I, so it's perfectly there. But it's a but it's a problem. And the reason I bring this up is because when you're going to go choose your brand name, go type it into Google, go type it into Amazon before you lock that trademark. That's a that's a quick tip on that. Um, the other thing I would say is that. As, as if you're starting doing side hustle branding or side hustle uh, kidding rather, and you're looking to how to get from 5k a month to 10k a month, the branding then starts to become way more important. The brown boxing thing is cool to get started and it's definitely viable. You could even have a million dollar brown box brand, 
But if you want to scale, you need to start investing into some branding and their brand name will start to matter and you'll get repeat business and all that. So that's my branding stick. We can move on from that. No, we don't have to. And here's why, because I keep telling people when you're doing, we are the in-between. So with poor man's private label is kind of what we call it. We're in between your straight up wholesale where people are all about volume and top sellers and you're making 10 cents on everything and trying to move 10,000 units all the way to the private label where everyone's doing completely their own thing, inventing their own products, making their own things. Wholesale bundles is in between that where you might have one private label item in there and some other wholesale items. You're making kits, you're making bundles, but the reality is you're still creating a brand even if it's a brand no one cares about right now and so talking about branding and talking about branded packaging we have a whole training on branded packaging creating custom packaging I mean I even just um, did this the other day so that people would know that literally you can get this in eight days even if you just want your logo on a poly bag this is mommy income of course but you know eight days less than a buck each you can print your own stuff and it just shows the extra level of commitment that you are to your customer when your customer gets something with your brand printed on it they automatically have a level of respect for your brand even if it's something they've never heard of because they're like oh they spent time money energy to create something that's um, looks a little bit more professional. It's worth its weight in gold, whether you realize it or not. People are just trying to make money on Amazon, right? But if you take these steps to make your item a little bit more professional, your customers will come back to you, even if you think they won't, because they're looking for that specific um, experience. Even if you, even if it's just Amazon, which a lot of people say, it's just Amazon, no one cares about your packaging. They actually do. Some, somebody like you has a branding touch, right? So like, look at just even looking at your background in the podcast, I have a high level of respect for your investment into your personal branding. I threw a, I threw a sign on the wall and called it a day. Right. But like, like this, this actually does matter. The impact of branding has waves, waves and waves of impact. Not only do you get your brand registry, which gets you a, a plus content on Amazon, which for me is a, and I'm a marketer, I'm not a brander, right? I'm a marketer. I go out and get traffic. That's what I do. Uh, but the conversion elements and, and the brand investment, it will pay off for years to come. So um, I, I, I love what you were talking about there. Yeah. And, you know, just for you guys who want, who don't know, um, I had that made on sticker mule, mommyincome.com slash sticker mule. You'll get 10 bucks free. If you sign up with that affiliate link, of course, always affiliate links. I love sticker mule. I have so many stickers, um, but I also have custom poly bags made from them with less than seven days. People get excuses of, I can't find a company. I can't find somebody who's going to print it affordably. I can't, you know, boxes are expensive, all that kind of stuff. It's the cost of doing business, but I tell you, it will one, you can raise your price with custom packaging packaging because when someone they get that in a brown box you're like eh, okay but if you actually got that in something that I just showed you or even a box that has a nice printed band around it you people aren't going to be like wow I, I paid $35 for this brown box instead they're gonna be like oh this is worth $35 because it's nice. So don't skimp on branding, you guys, and don't just gloss over that to make a buck because you can make a lot more money in the long run. Here at the Amazon Files at Mommy Income, we're about the long game. This is not a quick side hustle, pay your rent next month with this money. It's pay your retirement over time. So you're thinking about long-term business strategies. Okay, let's get back to keywords. Helium 10, um, is your favorite tool and you talked about titling you talked about that so when you talk about the body the building the the, the bullet points and the description what are your best practices Here, when it comes to those here's where the laziness seems to start for most sellers is bullet points and description they're like hey I'll, I'll get a great photo and i'll put up a cool title and i'll fill in the search term field but then the bullets come they just throw vomit i don't know what it is uh, so bullet best practices, capitalize the first phrase at the beginning of each bullet and then massage the keywords in. Here is not the place to keyword stuff. Here is the place to benefit feature analysis with keywords embedded, right? So I have a, a wine glass called Mama Shark Needs a Drink, do, 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 right? <laughs> Classic shark song and I'm I actually have scrolling through your store right now and I'm already like want to buy this <laughs> one want to buy this one I just and, saw that one and by the way when I first made this glass I'd never even heard the song and that makes you think for a second right so Lucky if a guy <laughs> if a guy like me who's never heard the song can make a make a product like this and stumble into a bestseller so can you and so can a hundred of your competitors right 
So the question of shotgun versus pistol, right? Where you're going to, I'm going to play a hundred poker hands and I know 10 of them's got pocket aces. I just don't know which 10, or I'm going to take my single shot measure twice and, and cut once. That's a personal choice, in my opinion. I believe there are people out there that could go either direction. Uh, and so feel free to figure that out. But last comment on the, the shark wine glasses. So I ended up developing 20 different SKUs, a gift for everybody in the family. You got sister shark, brother shark, mama shark, grandma shark. I even then started looking at, okay, what's the second most common use for grandma? Well, it's Nana and Nana. it's Nanny. And, and, and uh, so I put those out too. And they all sell really well. So, so if you're looking for product expansion, sometimes go back to your bestseller roots and just find another flavor of it. You um, know what's funny? Because I know that you're not as familiar with, with wholesale bundles, but you will be soon, um, is, is the idea that this is the same concept. We are literally like kindred spirits. First of all, you're already talking about um, pocket aces and poker. Like we could have a whole other episode <laughs> about that. Um, I'm a poker player in Texas Hold'em. Gotta love it. Um, but love then it. also talking about the variations, right? Like if you've got one, you've already done the keyword research, you've already got the listing, you've already got all the things. Instead of doing... Um, you know, all this brand new stuff, you just create something different. So the mommy shark one, right? Now you've got ant shark, dad shark, all the, you know, nana shark, whatever it is. Um, you're only doing the keyword research one time and then you're multiplying it. It's called working smarter, not harder. Now you've got 10 products instead of one and you only had to do the research and the list building one time. Then it's copy, switch out a couple words, paste, done. It's fast, but you have to do the initial research up front, build that awesome listing that you have and then start pigging backing on your own listings instead of continuing to reinvent the wheel all the time. I mean, that's just, that's just too much work. And you guys, when you're talking about bundles or talking about these different things, stop working more than you need to take the good listings that are already doing well and see what you can make out of it next. So you're, t you're talking about focus and you're talking about strategy and I, I love it. Um, so back to bullets. So I mentioned capitalize the first phrase, massage in the keywords, make sure the features are mentioned. And if you do that, you'll get some indexing love from it. So my shark glasses are currently number 33 in the top 100 wine glasses on Amazon today. And I didn't say funny wine glasses. I said top 100 wine glasses. So I have several of the top funny wine glasses in the wine glass category. And it's from diversification, it's from indexing, and it's from keyword investment and diversification of portfolio. So as we go down to the description, um, if you don't have brand registry, you do need to spend 100 words or characters, at least a bare minimum, of copy in your product description. Use some basic HTML, paragraph tags, bolding, uh, and you can use some bullet points. That's all you can do in the description. Now we get to A plus content and description questions. Now, Amazon's official policy says they do not index this section. I believe Amazon's a big fat liar, and I'll tell you why. I've put Spanish behind the alt text of a single photo with Spanish, and I indexed for Spanish within seven days. And here's my two cents on that, right? I learned that trick about a year ago. I didn't know that it was indexing and pictures and images. I had no idea. I named my images so that my admin can put them collectively together and put them in the listing. And so I name the product or at least an abbreviation or something, our brand, whatever it is, there is a identifier in that photo. Well, I had no idea that I Google searched something one time to look for some other keywords and stuff. My image came up in the Google search as an Amazon product. And it was because of the tag on the photo. So whatever you're naming your images, name your images. I don't care if it's really long, if it's gonna index, if it's gonna bring it up either through Google, back to Amazon, these SEO bots, these search bots are way smarter than us. And so they can pick up on so many different things. So don't skip out on the small details. It could mean a difference of $100 or $500 in your account this month by one tweak that you're making. And, and what I would say is this field is easier to set today than it was 90 days ago. So they made an update to A plus content. You do not have to reload the photo now to set the alt text. You can actually just go and hit edit on the photo and, the, and you don't have to reload it and the alt text field's there. There's a hundred characters. Now, 
if you're like me and the way you, I like to build my A plus content for me and my clients, we're taking up giant amounts of space. We're loading 20 photos. So let's say you load 20 photos at 100 characters, 20 times 100 characters. That's how many additional hundreds of keywords you can have plastered on your listing without looking like your keyword stuffing to the consumer. That's a big deal. That's a really big deal because if you can get more indexing, that's earned media. You're not paying for that. You're earning it. Hello, and so, free is my favorite price. So I'll do just about anything for that. Free or probably another phrase for it is sweat equity, right? Yeah. You have to spend time on it. Exactly. And, and so the, the question that I always find myself battling for, for business owners, whether you're a side hustler or you're a corporation, is where do you spend your time? Where do you focus? And how do you make prioritization something that you do on a daily basis? Because there's all these shiny objects out there. And the shiny object of our conversation today is keywords, right? right? How do you stack keywords against your other business objectives? That's not easy. That's not a, that's not a sound bite I can give you to give you inspiration. I could I say- I can, no. Okay. I can inspiration on that. Time is money. Money making tasks come first. And that's how you Agreed. prioritize. So when you're prioritizing for everybody, just a quick 15 minute hustle, that's, you know, 15 minute hustle.com. And you can get the ebook for that. You know, that's my 15 minute hustle. I got a chart. Those four tasks that go on that 15 minute hustle are all something that are going to put dollars in your pocket. So keyword optimization, we could argue, does that put money in your pocket? Yes or no. If you can be bumped up from the bottom of page one to the top of page one, just by changing your keywords, that's a money-making task. Something that goes into your pocket, money back into your pocket. There's other tasks you can outsource to admins. You can pay someone else to do. You can put it on that the 30th of the month, pick up all the slack tasks. But everyday daily tasks need to be putting money in your pocket. You're in business. This is not a hobby. You're not, you're, if you're not making money, you just have a really expensive hobby. So making sure that those money-making tasks come absolutely first and keyword optimization in your listing, in my opinion, is a money-making task because it gives you more visibility. More visibility equals more sales. That sounds pretty clear to me. I think you've got some clarity, ability, and resolve really summarized there. And, and if, you do, if you do that, the, the, the two questions I would add to that is, does it, does it increase traffic to your listing? Does it improve the conversion rate? If it does one of those two things, it makes income. And so if, if you use a framework like that, all of your decision tree can go from top to bottom. Now the question then becomes, what makes more income or less income? And that's where it gets harder and harder to prioritize. Um, so a couple more advanced things I want to make sure I mention before we run out of time. You, there's, a, there's what I like to call the pink word update. And if you've got brand registry, you have access to this. And any word that's in your title no longer needs to be in your search term field. And I mentioned I'd come back to this at the beginning of our conversation. And that's because when you're first getting started, it's, it's not important and it's a new listing. Don't worry about it. But as you look for 2.0 improvements, three, six months after your product's launch, I would come back to your keywords, do another round of optimization, remove words out of your title, um, out of the search term field that are currently in your title. And that will improve your indexing even further. I recommend updating your keywords every three to six months. You can track your keyword indexing in tools like Helium 10. Go focus on the words that are ranked 20 to 50 on your current listings that are doing well and then rehash the keyword strategy against it. So step one, fill it out. Step two, follow best practices. Step three, revisit it and come back and make further edits. You know, it's so funny. It's, it's, it's almost like, you know, for those of you guys who don't know, Steve and I have uh, recently met and we recently discovered each other's podcasts and stuff like that. But the more and more you're talking, the more and more it's just like, we are like Amazon brothers and sisters here, right? Because it's, this is the reality of this is I tell people when they create their listings to put it on the calendar, the day that they made the listing, 90 days from then, if you're hitting launch on your listing that you just built, put that date on the calendar three months from then to revisit your listing, to check keywords, to delete things that aren't working, to give it some thought. You guys, if you hear anyone say that Amazon is an automated, set it and forget it kind of business, and you can just sit they're back liars. And, teach and roll the cash <laughs> in, they're full of it. It is, that is a lie as far as it gets. Now, you guys know that I run my business. Um, I have a team. I have people that do the things and I do some things and they do some things and I do have location freedom because I'm not bringing inventory in and out of my house. But 
that doesn't mean that I'm not working. That doesn't mean that somebody or one of us is not working on listing optimizations all the time. Your listing is never a set it and forget it. Things go wrong. Keywords change, trends change. You're never going to have one product that you're going to sell for the next 20 years. And it's going to make you all your money. You're going to have to continually work on this because to, to what? your product life cycle, in my opinion, after yes, the product's been I, up two years, it dies. Yeah, a hundred percent agree with that. I feel like some things die even sooner. You know, if you're if you're getting into something that's pretty trendy, you know, baby shark do 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 is going to be out of our radar in probably the next couple of years. I, and it's gonna I thought it was going to be out by last year, but here we are. <sighs> <laughs> everywhere because the marketers have gotten into making the toys and the books and everything. So you see it everywhere. But again, just like that, like bring up a cartoon that was, you know, popular 10 years ago, Phineas and Ferb. Okay. I mean, you, you, your kids are too young to remember I, that. I've watched I, it. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Gotta love that platypus. I'm telling you, right? But my kids grew up on that, my older kids. And so like right now when my my BFF was just telling me her son is now watching Phineas and Ferb on Netflix or something like that. I'm like, that is super old. These things might have a little bit of a niche following later on, but you know, most of us have never even heard of that because if you, if you didn't have kids 10 years ago, you wouldn't have, it wouldn't have mattered. And so things do have a life cycle. Don't ever be duped into thinking that you're going to jump into Amazon, make some fast millions and jump out and retire. If you're going to end this for the long game, be prepared to re evolve your inventory. I, I would say even less than two years. You say it's two years. I think that's generous. I feel like a year, maybe two. Um, and then you've got, you know, things get discontinued or things just go out of trend. So paying attention to that is really important. Revisit your listings at least every three months, if not every six and cut the dead ones. I think too many people marry their inventory. They, they do treat them as children. There's no doubt about it. And you got to be careful about that. And because it, on occasion, you got to throw the bath water out with the baby. <laughs> and if you don't, you're going to have a cesspool in the bathroom. It's a problem. So be prepared to discontinue. Always 80-20 rule pretty much applies on products, you know, and can you keep stocking a bad, uh, you know, mediocre soap? Yeah, probably. You could probably stock it for a while, but don't invest in it. Go invest in the new. Spend, you got you to gotta put your new business hat on every single day, not your old business hat. Because if you don't do that, you're going to shrink. And you want to grow. If, right. you're not, if you're not growing, you're shrinking. My favorite phrase with that is, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. If you want more... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you want more, if you want better, if you want more streamlined, if you need more time in your life, if you need more money, if you need more freedom, you need more peace. Um, you need to continually grow and change and move. You can never stay where you are as much as that seems comfortable. It gets uncomfortable when it stops having the same results. In order to get new results, you have to do new things. And so- and Thinking about that with your inventory, it's the same. Okay, before we go, I really want you to give us at least one or two things that's like, do not do, never do. You know, this is things to avoid when it comes to keywords and titles and listings. Whatever you do, do not use a trademark phrase on your listing on the front end of any kind. It will, re it will create a listing yank. That's the official term, listing yank. And you'll get... Uh, the listing taken down, and then you've got to run through and figure out how to get it back up. Um, compatible with Lego. The word compatible with will save your bacon, guys. If you're using a kit that's compatible with Ray-Bans, with Lego, whatever it might be, the phrase of the day is compatible with. Do not use trademark names in your front-end listing, or you will pay the consequence when the Yanks come. Okay. I love that. And my, and that, that was the question I was going to ask next with that. So it's don't use trademark phrases. The number one question we're both going to get when it comes to this is how do you know which phrases are trademarked and how do you know what you can use and what you can't use? And so this is like the number one question I get all the time. Where's the list of these giant keywords that you're not allowed to use in your listings? Like someone just wants a list. Maybe we can collaborate and create a list. For them. <laughs> it would be a never ending list. That's the challenge. Um, exactly. So so the, so the first bar, if you can recognize the, the, the phrase as a brand name, don't use it. That's the easy first bar. Second bar, go Google trademark lookup, go to the USPTO and hit on the search our trademark database test link. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a link to this so you can add it in the description of our, our conversation today and hit basic word mark search. If you look that up and you find a trademark phrase used there in your category, so that's the important part and that's the technical part. If they're, if they're selling a blender and you're selling a blender and they've got a trademark name in the blender world, you absolutely cannot use it. If you're selling the blender, but they're in the music world, it's safe. Go ahead and proceed.
Do your homework. You know what? Most people don't even go that deep in order to tell, but guess what? If it's not trademarked, it's gold. Use it. But if it isn't, it can get you yanked. So that's like literally the difference in black and white of what you can do. Listen, guys, most of your competitors are lazy. Most of your competitors aren't listening to podcasts, aren't watching YouTube videos. Don't give a rip. They're just throwing up listings and hoping for the best. You guys are smarter than that. You're better than that. Do the work now and reap the benefits later. This is not get rich quick. This is get rich over time and keep staying that way. So do the hard work now. Do things like looking up phrases and making sure, because if it's not trademarked, use it and use it to your advantage. I love the compatible with. If you guys missed everything until then and you want to use that, this, this happened to a client of mine where he was selling accessories to a very popular vacuum and he was getting blocked and he was getting blocked and he was getting blocked. And I said, okay, try this, try this phrasing because I know you can list this because it's compatible. You can sell generic um, vacuum bags or whatever you want to sell, but it's compatible with, you know, these name brands. So he tried that is Linda, his listing indexed within 24 hours and he started getting sales. So if that's something that, you know, you're thinking about using compatible with, um, is really helpful. That is like a really big ticket thing. If you guys have things that are brand comparable, but they're not actually the brand. Last five second tip. If you have indexing issues, if your product's not found in search, check the category ID. If your category is blank on the back end of Amazon, fill it in. It will fix within 24 hours. Woohoo! That's amazing. Okay. And now last and final question. Um, give us something that many people don't know about Steven, just something interesting, a fun fact about yourself, something that like, okay, no one would ever know that about me. Um, I'm a nationally ranked chess player, but I've been out of the chess community for a few years. When I started my family, it got a lot more difficult to travel to tournaments, but I, I, um, I won my division uh, in the U S open uh, while I was in high school in Florida uh, back in 2008. And so I love to think ahead. <laughs> awesome. That, that, that doesn't surprise me either, just knowing that that, because, you know, super strategy oriented, thinking about the next three moves before you even make one. That's awesome. Well, congratulations, chess champion and my Amazon guy. So again, everywhere you can find Steven, tell them the best place to find you. MyAmazonGuy.com if you want to learn about services, uh, YouTube.com slash MyAmazonGuy if you want to learn about any problem that you have running in that you face you can't solve, chances are I have a video on it. 300 plus videos on every problem you could face in Amazon on my YouTube channel. And if you haven't figured it out already, this guy is legit. His YouTube video is super hot fire. Lots of stuff to learn there. Um, he might be making an appearance again in our Amazon Files Hub community. So if you guys aren't in the membership hub community, I know Steven has graciously agreed to um, maybe do some training videos in there for what you guys need. So you better get into it, mommyincome.com slash hub if you want to see more from Steven. Again, thank you so much for your time and energy. Um, this has been really, really helpful and I appreciate all your time. Thanks for coming, Steven. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.